it seems if the it seems if the animals have been let loose and they're already deemed a hazard, they shouldn't be returned to their owner. They should be impounded. That owner had a heightened level of responsibility to keep that animal contained. And if they did not, they need to have that animal impounded until they can prove that they've remediated and made their um, ability to contain their animal safer so that the animal cannot get loose. If the animals have gone out and caused any harm, killed any animals, bitten someone, then perhaps they don't get returned to their owner. But there needs to be uh, the animal impounded and there needs to be a, an investigation take place within a reasonable time frame to address these issues, to simply return them to the owner if they've then harmed anybody while they're out and there's no recourse. There's nothing for the people with the other animals that have been harmed. Other dogs have been bitten, cats have been bitten, killed. People can be harmed. And apparently we just return the dogs to their owners and don't do anything about it. So I would like that issue looked at. Thank you. All right. And then I don't see any, okay, Evan. Uh, good morning. Are you able to hear me? Indeed. Good morning. Morning. Yeah, I was just curious um, why the agenda didn't have anything specifically around our in response team, as it was one of uh, the more, if not the most substantive uh, outcome, you know, uh, uh, public demand over the last few years. And it's something that uh, really is one of the, the better moves we've made as a city. Um, I'm sure, you know, in uh, regular council meetings, it's going to be addressed, but I just like the subcommittee to keep in mind that there's a lot of public interest uh, in the ongoing work of that program and the specifics of it. I know that the, the city website has a lot of details, which are very helpful, but um, having opportunities for public open forum discussion, I think would be really useful because you know the the implementation and ongoing community feedback uh, about refining and improving such services is something of really high importance to many um, community members regarding uh, public safety public health public wellness and improving the trust and bond between uh, you know our elected leaders our unelected our, our first responders, law enforcement, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I just thought it kind of seemed like a omitted priority. And I just wanted to say that to the subcommittee. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Evan, for that feedback. I really appreciate it. Do we have anybody else calling in who'd like to make comment before we go to our pre-recorded public comment? All right, then let's take pre-recorded public comment. Oh, I'm wondering if you could turn up the volume a bit on this. Thank you.
Are we gonna, um, have we already heard both public comments? Uh, those look like new raised hands. So I don't know if you, I don't know how that works. Okay, so I couldn't hear either of the, I, I saw that we started to play Renee, but I couldn't hear either of their public comments. Uh, the recorded ones? Right, and I see we shouldn't have a chat box on this um, because it's um, a Brown Act meeting, but. Um, so are you not seeing the item four slideshow? Or in the slide? No, I can, I can see it, but um, but I can see that neither myself nor a member of the public can hear what the callers are saying. Okay, hmm. I have the volume all the way up. Um, okay. Well, why don't we go to um, M. Tigerson, um, Leslie, because you spoke previously, we cannot have you speak again, but um, we'll take Tigerson. And then we'll Didn't hear out. any of the comments, Margie. Thank you. We're aware we're working on it. We'll move on to Okay, so I suppose then um, down there on four nineteen yesterday at seven twenty. I don't see uh, the other hand raised anymore. No, but I hear something now in the background. Is that I think Les if Leslie could mute, perhaps. Can we? So Leslie's not a panelist. We should just be able to unmute um, her speaking or remove speaking permissions. Oh, there we go. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. No worries. So then um, I suppose that we'll just move on and see if we can resolve the issue about the pre reported public comment at some point. Yeah, I will um, see if I can get some assistance and also try to do the slideshows at the same time. Yeah. Um, yes, uh, Council Member Rogers. It, that was a mistake, sorry. Oh, okay. All right. So let's move on then to item five, new business. And my, my sincere apologies to the public. Um, we really do want to hear what you have to say and apologize for the, the technical difficulties. So this will be um, Chief Westrope will bring us an update. Good morning, Chief. Good morning, Chair Fleming. Good morning, Councilmember Rogers. Scott Westrope, Fire Chief. Hello. Ms. Uh, I'm going to call on Sue because when she has her hand up, it's usually something. Serious. I just wanted to confirm that we are trying to and confirm for the public that we are trying to get the volume issue corrected and that we will play those messages later in the meeting. Yes. That correct? Thank you very Thank much. You. Their comments are very important to us. All right. On to you, um, Chief Westrope. Did City Manager Smith need to jump in there? I was just going to say I have someone working on it now. Thank you. All right. Good morning. And uh, good morning to you, Chair Fleming and uh, Councilmember Rogers, Scott Westrow, Fire Chief. And with me today is Fire Marshal Paul Lowenthal. And what we wanted to do today was to bring you um, an update on three of our main uh, programs that we're working on, just to give the subcommittee an idea of, of the progress on some of those as they've um, the, the subcommittee has been part of the development and implementation of these programs uh, since their implementation. So the first is the Recruitment and Diversity Strategic Plan, and I'll kind of go through briefly by strategy um, and talk about where we're at with each one of the strategies. And as you recall, the Recruitment and Diversity Strategic Plan is essentially an upstream investment in the community um, to educate and inform uh, the community of Santa Rosa and the surrounding areas about opportunities within the fire service and with the city of Santa Rosa and give uh, the youth of our community the tools necessary to be successful um, either in a career in public safety or in general. So um, we have implemented that plan we did last year and things have been going very, very well. Um, on the communication strategy, which was strategy one, on the social media marketing aspect, um, it's well underway and we're using the youth of our organization um, to really build the social media marketing side of the organization. Um, we're working with Ciro and the PIO shop um, to adapt to the changes in the platforms being used and making sure that our strategies are 
are really adhering to and, and drawing in the youth of our community. Um, all of our posts are currently being translated, so everything's in English and Spanish, um, and really seeing a lot of success and a lot of um, likes and things like that. Paul can probably speak more to exactly what it is, but um, really a lot of interest around the social media aspect and um, some of the recruits that we're seeing coming in or the laterals that we're seeing come in are a result of that. Um, on the updating our website, and that's currently underway as well. Um, the team's working on building how-to videos. So it's short snippet videos of how to become a firefighter, how to get into the junior college, how to get into different programs, virtual tours of firehouses and fire engines and ladder trucks, things like that. So I'm um, really drawing the attention in, um, providing the youth of the community and community members at large um, additional resources for career in public safety and really just better flow and usage of the website, um, getting back to where it's it's really drawing people in and um, really leaning on to the needs of the, the youth of the community versus you know, my generation, which is it's pretty basic website and interest card that doesn't really fly anymore. So um, a lot of good work being done by the team there and really um, leveraging technology to um, recruit people into the organization or into our programs. And the second strategy, which is really the, the heart of the matter is our recruitment programs. And the first uh, portion of that is the community engagement and education. And uh, one of our fire captains, Captain Corey Rickert, uh, is in charge of that. And she's done a great job of really building this up and uplifting this program. Um, you know, the reins are out and she's, she's absolutely doing the lion's share of the work and doing a great job with it. So far, we're integrated with Santa Rosa City Schools from the superintendent down, Roseland Unified School District from the superintendent down, and we're engaged with the CT Foundation for all schools across the community. Um, some of the programs or projects we've been involved with so far um, at LC Allen, we've been involved with the Career Week. Um, both myself and our engine companies and our community outreach specialists were involved several days at the Career Week. And we just attended the Cal State Long Beach Health Fair at LC Allen High School as well. Been involved in several career days, much more than we ever have been in the past, um, providing mock interviews at different schools, schools throughout the community. And recently, we just partnered with the Office of Community Engagement to come into their program, which is a, a pilot program at Santa Rosa Middle School um, as an outreach program to some of the youth in the community there as well. So we're really um, spreading our wings and trying to be involved much more at the educational level of the community. The Youth Fire Explorer program is slated to start this summer. Um, one of our engineers is in charge of that program. Um, and what we've done is every event we go to, we have QR codes. Um, that people can use to sign up for either the Youth Explorer program or the mentorship program. And so we can gather their information and contact them when the programs are ready. Um, and we have more than 50 students already interested in the Fire Youth Explorer program. So I'm really excited to get that off the ground. We're just working on some outside funding opportunities for that. And the uh, Fire Explorer program will be underway. Um, the mentorship program where we're essentially providing mentors to protégés that are students in the community. Um, is actually underway. We do have uh, mentors and protégés both in the program. Um, and again, we've gotten a lot of interest through the use of the QR codes at different events that we go to. Our partnership with the junior college is um, as strong as it's ever been. It's always been strong. It's just getting stronger. Um, we're integrated in the fire academy and paramedic academy there. Um, they have different programs for, um, for organizations to come in and, and talk to those classes. And, and we garner a lot of interest there. Um, and we co-hosted a Veterans Day event with the Santa Rosa Junior College um, on Veterans Day, where some of our veteran firefighters were out there engaged with veterans through their Office of Veterans Affairs and, and garnered a lot of interest there as well. And last but certainly not least um, in the sub-strategies, our Women Public Safety Day, we had a very successful first year event on March 5th of this year. Um, we had over 350 attendees and 40 different organizations throughout the Bay Area tent. And so it was uh, to be the first pass, it was absolutely incredible uh, with the women in the uh, fire department put on and everybody's support to be there um, was, was really incredible to see my daughter included. And uh, so we're looking forward to that being an annual event uh, moving forward and getting bigger and better. Um, the next, uh, next strategy is the selection processes. Um, and part of the sub-strategy of that is bringing in implicit bias and cultural competency training for anyone who sits on any interview panel throughout the organization regardless of bureau or position. Um, that's currently under development and will be implemented by the end of the year. And then use of community members in oral board interviews, um, that was implemented immediately. So we're using that across um, all bureaus and all ranks. Uh, we're using community members that come in and, 
to be part of that or uh, part of that process. Um, the data analysis piece, um, which is one of the strategies we're currently working with the Seed Collaborative on developing what the strategy with the uh, data points are going to be uh, to track our progress. So we're we're using their expertise, and we'll have those done uh, probably in the next couple months. Um, and we can go back and get old data and put it into the system and and track our track our effectiveness in this in this program. And then recruitment staffing was the last strategy, and uh, for that we're using current staff right now. And we, like I've said before. Um, we had about a 60 to 70 percent response from our organization internally who wanted to be part of this and each strategy is led by uh, somebody in the organization and, and they do it as a as a uh, collateral assignment um, with the seed collaborative we have uh, three committees essentially we have the recruitment and diversity task force which is the large group and then that was broken down into two, two subcommittees one on recruitment and one on hiring um, we're actually we just wrapped up the work with the seed on Monday, and uh, our recommendations will be moving from our recruitment and diversity task force to the city equity task force um, in an upcoming meeting. So um, we're really excited about where we're going and um, and a lot of the progress that we're making. And I'll pause here to see if either of the community members have any questions on the recruitment and diversity strategic plan. Council member Rogers. I don't have any questions. I'm just thrilled to hear this stuff. This has been a huge priority of mine since joining the council and to see it taken this seriously with this much deal, detail and thought and execution just makes me really, I'm really proud. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. We really appreciate that. And we, we do take it serious and, and we're very excited about it. And, uh, you know, you know, it's one of my top priorities. It always has been, and uh, it comes from the heart. And, and the heart of these, this organization has been tremendous as far as the response and their dedication to it. Well, thank you. I hope you pass on the, that comment to your team. Um, we'll, uh, let's see, turn to the public and see if they have any questions about this, unless um, you have more to add before we open it up for public comment. Not on this one, we have two more two more slides to go through, essentially. Uh, so Why don't we finish the, the slides and then we'll open it up. My apologies. No, no worries. Um, the, uh, the next plan we wanted to talk about and give you an update on was the Wildland Resiliency and Response Strategic Plan. And again, if you recall, this was essentially an internal look at the organization um, with, uh, you know, and see, to see how we could be better in the wildland realm without adding stations or people. So it was really how we can refocus and re-equip our, our personnel um, to be better in the wildland response. And you know we've always been a, a stellar department as far as um, urban firefighting goes, and we're a very good wildland fire department, but the uh, environment in the world has changed around us. And so it's adapting to that. So on that front, there's uh, five strategies, or I'm sorry, six strategies that go with that. The first is legislation. And uh, you know, Paul and his team are working very hard on the legislative aspect. And some of the examples of that is um, this year you will see that uh, we'll be bringing forward a vegetation management ordinance um, to uh, the council for adoption. Um, and so changing local ordinance is important. We work with our state partners and our state lobbying team on working on state um, guidance and laws um, as, they as they relate to uh, wildfires. And then even federal guidelines, um, for instance, we've worked really hard as a team throughout the city to change a lot of the provisions of the Stafford Act. Um, so we're making a lot of changes across, you know, really every sector of, of the uh, of government uh, to make the legislation and the guidance as, as best it, as it can be and, and use our insight and use our lessons learned um, to help other communities in the future. Uh, the second strategy is capital enhancements. And uh, as I reported to the subcommittee and to council, um, this is really looking at um, how we equip um, our fleet. And so we purchased one type, we actually purchased two type three fire engines um, right out of the gate. And we were really, really fortunate that they were actually uh, demo units from the manufacturer, but it was the exact spec that we wanted. So we were able to buy that based on the funding that was provided by council. Um, we received one last September. Uh, the second one has actually arrived in Sacramento and it should be delivered to Santa Rosa this week. And then from there, we already have all the equipment for it based, uh, based on the fact that we had the funding. And so it'll be in service probably in the next two weeks. And so we'll have the, uh, the second type three fire engine, engine 27 in service. And we'll obviously communicate that to council when it arrives and it's ready to go. We're currently trying to purchase two type six fire engines, which are the smaller fire engines that are built on a commercial uh, pickup or truck uh, chassis. 
we're having some difficulties with actually uh, purchasing a chassis. And so there's some, some delays in that. Uh, we're working really hard on it, but essentially the commercial chassis aren't being built by the major manufacturers right now to focus on electric vehicle fleet. And so we don't, they've been, we've been told that they're not building any commercial, commercial vehicle chassis until the fourth quarter of this year, but we're trying everything we can based on the fact that we have the funding available to us to move that forward. Um, and in the meantime, we're working on the tactical water tender, which will be our second water tender um, to bring into the fleet as well. Uh, we purchased new dual band mobile radios and mobile repeaters for all of our equipment. Um, those should be here relatively quickly um, as far as the supply chain goes, but essentially those are the radios that go in our apparatus or in our command vehicles, and they'll be dual banded, meaning that we'll be able to talk on our normal fire and ambulance uh, traffic, and also we will be able to switch over to the law enforcement banks. So what that does is it creates a much smoother path when we're trying to um, when we're trying to work on uh, evacuations, so we're all on the same page and we're on the same communication channel. So that's a big enhancement for us. And with that came the mobile repeaters, which are essentially a disc that'll go on top of our command vehicles and turn them into a mobile repeater site. So on our channels that are uh, line of sight, meaning our tactical channels, we're gonna have the, have the ability to repeat those. So it really expands our radio network uh, throughout wherever one of our vehicles is parked. So it's a huge enhancement to our communication strategy as well. On the non-capital enhancement, <clears throat> which is the third strategy, um, we've purchased all new state-of-the-art uh, personal protective equipment for our firefighters. And so essentially we always had state-of-the-art equipment, but there's two versions of that. There's the CAL FIRE spec and then there's the local government spec. And so now we have both capabilities. Um, so that's been a big enhancement. And we purchased portable radios for each one of our members. So it'll be an assigned radio. So one of the issues we run into, if you recall, is when we have these large scale events, we have to call people back to work. So instead of delaying trying to find them radios and get them on a piece of equipment, they will not have that available to them right away. And so it'll increase um, that ability and it will increase our capability as far as communication goes, because just like anything else, communication is the first thing to fail in an emergency. So. Um, on the operations front, we really looked at our operations to make sure that we were using industry standard, which we, we really are, but um, we're finalizing the plans on um, detailing some of our operational guidelines and making sure that they're uh, meeting industry standard and that we're um, consistent throughout the state. Um, that'll be completed prior to the uh, 2022 fire season. And then on the staffing strategy, again, that was not adding staffing, that was looking at um, different staffing models, our upstaffing plan when we upstaff during a red flag event or when we do an all call, essentially revising our policy and that's almost complete. That'll be done before the season starts uh, this year. And last but not least is community engagement. Um, we've really been invested in the community outreach and preparedness programs throughout the city. Um, we have been since last year. Uh, for instance, this funding will go towards the uh, wildfire preparedness event that uh, is being co-hosted by Office of Community Engagement on May 21st. Uh, it's a community-wide event that will be held at Courthouse Square, uh, but the funding that was provided by Council for WUI 2.0 will be used to um, purchase some of the equipment that we can use ongoing and educational information we can use ongoing at that event. Um, we've made a lot of programmatic improvements to alert and warning. Um, the city of Santa Rosa was the first local government city of our size to receive our own IPOS license. So essentially now the city has the ability to send any alert and warning um, tool that we need as far as emergency alert system, reverse 911, all the emergency alerting systems that we have. We always worked with the county and had a co-license, but now we have our own license. So a lot of great work by our emergency management team there. And lastly, um, I just wanted to talk about the remote automated weather stations. Uh, we received a federal grant to essentially put seven weather stations through in the microclimates of Santa Rosa. They will be public facing and forward facing. So we can monitor those microclimates because right now we have weather stations at key site or at the airport. Well, as you know, if you travel throughout town, there's a lot of different microclimates. So we've strategically located those weather stations through this federal grant. I'm able to uh, monitor our weather better. And also we can pre-position stage our equipment better based on the microclimates of, um, of our area. So that's where we're at on the uh, WUI 2.0 plan. And I'll pause to see if either one of the committee members has any questions on that. Council member Rogers, any questions? Okay. Um, I've got a couple of questions. One is um, for myself and the public, can you review the, in a broad stroke, what the Stafford Act is? 
The Stafford Act is, that has to do more with recovery and resiliency based on a disaster. And so it's a FEMA policy. And so what we ran into in particular, it's both for the community at large. And so it's a lot of the um, disaster recovery and, recovery and resiliency um, acts that you would see I mean, if a federally declared disaster was announced um, as it was with the tubs. What we ran into locally was that um, moving fire station five to a new location did not fall within Stafford Act provisions because the Stafford Act was built for Eastern and Midwest disasters, meaning it was built for fire, uh, floods, hurricanes, and tornadoes. So for instance, with station five, there was no ability for us to move fire station five lower into the floodplain, which is safer for fires, but not safer for floods. Their, their guidance didn't allow that. And so um, we worked with MMO and our team at CIRO um, and Senator Padilla's office to change the Stafford Act to look at um, wildfires more, more holistically or look at disasters more holistically throughout the entire United States. And so, um, so there's a lot of changes to uh, what will be provided to the public, but will also be provided to public agencies should a federally declared disaster occur. Thank you. And I think uh, for the public, CIRO is community or uh, communications and intergovernmental relations office. And then um, can you go over um, what having our, uh, in a little more detail, what having our own IPAS um, license would mean for us? Yeah. And really it's, it's administrative, um, you know, after 2017, where the city of Santa Rosa did not have control over its own um, alert and warning programs. It was based in the county. Uh, we made a lot of strides between 2017 and 2019 um, with the county to make sure that we had access to that. So if we had to do an emergency alert, whether it was the emergency alert system or the reverse 911 system, whatever the case may be, um, we had the ability to do it and we were able to do that um, with the county. Essentially what this means is with our own license, we now have the ability to send those from the city of Santa Rosa. But quite frankly, we would never do that without partnership with the county. So it would be a coordinated event regardless, but it just goes to show the hard work that's being done by, um, by our lobbyists, by the intergovernmental relations team and uh, our emergency managers and our city managers on moving Santa Rosa forward and using the lessons that we learned to make sure that other communities don't face what we faced, particularly in 2017 with alert and warning. So um, while it's administrative, it's a, it's a big win and just shows um, the voice that we have as, as Santa Rosa. Okay, excellent, thank you. So with that, I will open it up for public comment. Yep. Do we one have... more, one more, <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. It's okay. Um, I just want to turn it over to Fire Marshal Lowenthal real quick for a brief update on the vegetation management program. Okay. And then we're done. <laughs> we'll get to this one quickly for them. So the third and final slide is the vegetation management program. So just giving a quick update on where we're at with that. Uh, Chief Westrope touched on a little bit with the code language. So we will be coming forward uh, with a adoption of the new uh, code language in January of 2023. So you'll see some readings uh, from myself and Chief Building Official Jesse Oswald towards the end of this year. And part of that will be evaluating uh, exactly uh, what the chief talked about, uh, new code language that we want to bring into uh, the 2023 adoption uh, as part of the three-year code cycle. So we'll be looking at of things, uh, not only out of the fire code that we want to make improvements to, but also based on what's in the community wildfire protection plan, uh, which leads into the second point. So as you know, that is our five-year roadmap that was approved just weeks prior to the glass fire. Uh, we are due for our second uh, annual update in September uh, of this year to show where we're at in those nine objectives and 46 actionable items. I saw during the last update, a lot of progress had been made uh, and looking forward to continuing to make a lot more progress uh, on that plan. With that, uh, the funding to implement the plan, uh, as we've talked about in the past, came primarily from the PG&E settlement funds and then the additional funds that were allocated to offset the costs of the grants in the event that we were awarded them, which we were. So we were successful in receiving relatively, uh, in a really short period of time, award letters for all three grants. Uh, they are our evacuation fuels reduction program through HMGP that's being federally funded through FEMA. Second program is what we refer to as buoy modification, which will be home assessment, as well as helping offset the costs of home hardening in the form of gutter guards and vent screens. 
And then the third, and that's also at HMGP through FEMA. And then the third is a uh, HCD grant where we were awarded the total of uh, uh, half million dollars. And that'll be for primarily outreach, education, uh, and staff time to uh, help implement those needs. The two HMGP grants total uh, just shy of $5 million. They're $2.1 and $2.8 million a piece. Uh, and we have our quarter 25% uh, cost share. So we are awarded what we refer to as phase one. So phase one will carry us this year and that'll be to start building the framework for those large scale projects, the GIS support, and then ultimately opting community members into it. Once we've opted the community members into it and we have the framework in place, then we'll take that back to FEMA and Cal OES and then, and then uh, move forward hopefully within phase two to actually implement the, both of those programs uh, and the plan for that implementation and work would be next year. Uh, on the partnership front, uh, we're finalizing an, an MOU right now with FireSafe Sonoma. Uh, and this is an exciting opportunity for us. FireSafe Sonoma just hired its first executive coordinator. And FireSafe Sonoma is the true FireSafe Council for the county and really will continue to act as the kind of leader in the county for mitigation, prevention, and everything wildfire uh, prevention related. The issue that FireSafe Sonoma has had is that it really hasn't had a home uh, for a, a number of years. Uh, when the County of Sonoma went through some of the reorganization, there used to be a Sonoma County Fire and Emergency Services. That agency doesn't exist anymore. And so FireSafe Sonoma hasn't really had an umbrella organization. So Santa Rosa is helping with that. Uh, we will provide them with a space to really help flourish that, that organization. And that will not only help the community, but it'll help us. So we see a lot of benefits in helping, uh, helping with this coordination. And by no means is it Santa Rosa taking over Fire Safe Sonoma. That's not the intention at all. It's just giving them kind of a home and some, some support to make it a, a successful organization and, and help all of us. Because as we know, fire doesn't know boundaries and we all benefit from that organization uh, uh, continuing to push and lead throughout our county. The vegetation management program has three positions that are allocated to it uh, to help with the process. Uh, those are limited term positions and we're in the recruitment for those uh, right now. It'll be for two inspectors and an additional plans examiner. And those inspectors, uh, are, that work is currently being absorbed by, by existing staff right now and they're very busy. There's a lot of outreach uh, and information requests from neighborhoods, from neighbors, from HOAs. So our staff are in the field year round right now uh, since uh, since the, well, as much, much more since the glass fire, uh, but obviously since the Tubbs fire, uh, really uh, in the community a lot, doing a lot of work to help educate on defensible space, home hardening, vegetation management, talking about weed abatement and anything and everything in between, uh, which ties into the community engagement that is happening and continues to happen. Uh, the, we're still continuing to push all of our wildfire ready and ready Santa Rosa uh, information. Uh, and then lastly uh, is, uh, projects in addition to the grants that we have in process. So we've historically used uh, remaining funds from our weed abatement, pro weed abatement project uh, and programs to implement vegetation management programs. We'll be using those funds as well as our existing uh, hazard uh, vegetation management funds to implement a couple more projects this year. Last year we did work in Howarth Park and uh, worked and constructed a fire break along Sullivan Ridge. And we also conducted a constructed a fire break on the unburned portion of the lower area of the Skyhawk open space. This year, we're looking at doing work along Fountain Grove Parkway and between Sinead and Brush Creek Road uh, on the, as you're heading downhill, be on your right hand shoulder or the south side, uh, as well as additional work in the uh, interchange uh, at Sinead and Fountain Grove Parkway, and potentially on the opposite side of uh, Howarth Park as well this year along Medica Trail. So uh, we are continuing to use SAC uh, for that, uh, for those opportunities. And we'll also continue to work with CAL FIRE uh, for uh, crew availability. And sorry, one last project that we have that's actually an exciting one for us that does actually come out of the Community Wildfire Protection Plan as well as our partnerships with CAL FIRE is a unique opportunity to actually conduct our first prescribed fire within the city limits. Um, that is something that we have not been able to do historically. Uh, as you know, we brought the burn ordinance forward uh, last year, uh, and that was the first time we allowed on a very limited basis burning, uh, pile burning in specific locations to help mitigate the risks here locally uh, under very specific protocols. 
Um, but now we have an opportunity through our partnership with Caltrans and Cal Fire to uh, per conduct a prescribed fire along Old Redwood Highway uh, in between the Fountain Grove, uh, the old Fountain Grove Inn, the uh, Hilton Hotel, uh, and I believe it's the uh, Fountain Grove Business Complex. There's about 10 acres there uh, that we will be conducting a prescribed fire on that property uh, in June. So that again is a really unique opportunity for us. That area is actually um, a mitigation uh, area that was as a result of the interchange that took place there. So uh, we saw how the lack of maintenance kind of led to some overgrowth that took place in there. So this will be an opportunity for us to help keep that area healthy, clear, and show the community uh, that we are doing everything we can to make our community safer and the benefits of prescribed fires. And that is it. Fantastic. Um, do you, um, Council Member Rogers, do you have any questions? Um, I was I was going to ask the question um, of how are we working with other um, organizations in the community to uh, with the vegetation management with like other uh, regional or state um, lands, but I think you started to go into it, and it looks like you guys are. Um, working at it. It's just not something that we can do all at one time. And so the public may not see it being done all at one time. Um, it's a step-by-step -step process. Um, it was asked to me in the community. So I was passing it, passing it forward. Um, so thank you very much for everything that you are doing. It sounds like you guys are very, very busy. Um, and thank you for all the work. It is definitely needed on all fronts. Yeah, no, absolutely. And yes, you're right. The, as I said, as a board member for Fire Safe Sonoma, so this will be a good opportunity for us to improve uh, those uh, relationships that we have right now. But we do have them from the homeowner associations in Oakmont to Fountain Grove to Bennett Valley um, to the county level with parks and uh, our different fire agencies, as well as at a state level with Cal Fire and, and State Park. So we have good relationships with them. We're continuing to build them and remain in communication with them as we work on uh, projects that we can collaborate on. Great, and I have a question. Um, so first of all, it sounds like a big deal to be able to do a prescribed burn in the city limits. Um, and it sounds like it's gonna add some huge safety advantages for us. I'm curious to know, since you said it's gonna be in June and with impending fire season, what your plans for communication with the community are? Because if I don't know what's going on and I smell smoke, um, I would probably be, not probably, I would be very fearful. So what can we um, do to communicate with people and how can we as council members help promote the message? Yeah, so that's a good question. Thank you. So yes, yeah, so there's a lot of method that went into the madness of establishing that date. And it's one to get a clean, effective burn that is healthy for that hillside and then two to work through uh i don't want to say red tape but some red tape at a state level uh working with caltrans and uh you know getting through the environmental concerns of bay area quality management district permitting but then three is also to give us the time that we need to engage with the community and make sure that it's crystal clear of what's going to be taking place so we're working on everything from you know the nixle message to literally the signs uh, we're actually working on having a sign that's going to be made and posted on that property that'll talk about the future prescribed burn that'll take place at that location uh, we're going to conduct it on a sunday morning uh, to lessen the impacts to highway 101 um, but with caltrans involved there'll be signs out on the day of um, but really the the messaging from city connections to social media to um to the to an actual nixle Will all take place and it'll be coordinated to ensure that uh, we're doing everything we can to make sure that it is taking place uh, and that people are aware of it. Um, with that, you know, it's it's subject to the weather. So although the date is picked, um, if for some reason the conditions are not appropriate for us to conduct a healthy, safe prescribed burn, it will not take place and it'll be canceled. So uh, a lot of effort uh, is going into us at a, at a local level, although it is state property in the city limits, the Santa Rosa Fire Department is taking the lead on this. Um, Cal Fire uh, will be there to support, and Caltrans is helping us with the environmental paperwork. Uh, but it's our staff, and we're we're committed to making sure that this is a successful event. It's healthy, educational, and the community is as informed as we can uh, make them about it. Wonderful. Um, have you also reached out to the newspaper to see if they would be willing to 
print something or even purchase a small ad saying that this is coming up maybe the day before or something? We haven't yet, but we have had multiple requests from uh, not only our print, but our Bay Area uh, television stations that they've always been very interested in any time Santa Rosa is doing any sort of uh, vegetation management or any sort of projects. They've asked for it and they want to cover it. Um, in fact, when uh, they found out we were doing the work in, in um, Howard Park, they sent crews up and it was all over the evening news. So we've established a lot of good relationships with both our local and, and Bay Area news stations and we'll absolutely make this uh, um, visible to them and, and allow them to be part of the, the outreach um, as well as educational campaign and, and marketing for it. Well, thank you so much. This is all really exciting stuff and hopefully will keep us safe through fire season. So with that, can I now go to public comment? Great. All right. So do we have any members of the public wishing to comment on um, item 5.1, fire chief's update? I don't see any hands raised at the moment. Do we have any pre-recorded public comment? We do not have any pre-recorded comments. Okay. With that, I'll thank you, gentlemen, and let you get back to the important work of keeping us safe. Thank you both very much. All right. So now we'll move on to item 5.2. This is um, an update from our police chief, Chief Navarro. Good morning, Chair Fleming and Council Member Rogers. Uh, it's good to be with you this morning. Um, I will, uh, we have a couple of long uh, items coming up here, so I'm going to try to keep this uh, fairly short, but uh, uh, we have, uh, I wanted to give you an update on some of the community uh, uh, engagement things that we've been doing. Uh, before I get there, uh, there was a comment earlier this morning about uh, in response and uh, wanting to know more information. I do want to let the community know that the team is uh, being, it's uh, very busy right now uh, for the team. And uh, we are gonna be providing uh, some additional information in the next few weeks. Uh, we're, uh, we're working on, as, as you know, we have a team that is uh, working, uh, teams working seven days a week. Um, we're working on expanding the team for greater co coverage for, for hours, uh, starting hopefully this summer. And uh, we are going to be having an informational meeting by Zoom on May 4th uh, to talk about the first three months of the program. Uh, Captain John Krieger will be providing some information on that uh, on, at that meeting. Uh, we, we are going to be sending out information via social media and then also City Connections next week to let the community know on how to be able to participate and view the, uh, the information on May 4th. Uh, in addition to that, again, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of our uh, engagement opportunities. Uh, we have, uh, it's been two years since we've been able to do a lot of things, and so um, it's been exciting to be able to uh, open up and uh, re-engage with the community uh, as uh, uh, restrictions are lifted. Uh, we've had several opportunities, including the March 26 Mary Lou Lowrider event, which was uh, well attended. And I want to thank our Office of Community Engagement for uh, spearheading uh, that, uh, that program with the Lowrider Council. Uh, on March 11th, we held our first coffee with a cop. Uh, that is, uh, it's, it's uh, just a really uh, great event to be able to have positive uh, interaction uh, in a very uh, like uh, low key uh, opportunity with uh, police officers and dispatchers and, and technicians where our staff can go and uh, the community can talk to people, uh, talk to our staff, uh, just at a very, uh, you know, um, uh, again, a, a very low key event. Uh, we do plan on having those Coffee with the Cops quarterly. So I would expect another one uh, coming up in May or, or I'm sorry, in uh, June or July. Uh, we will uh, uh, make sure to let, let the community know via social media. Um, and so we just ask our, uh, our community members to continue to follow us um, and uh, uh, look at our website for upcoming events. Uh, another exciting event was uh, the uh, implementation or the re-implementation of our community police, police experience. Uh, we have 15 community members who are in the middle of an eight week course. Uh, they're getting a firsthand account of uh, the daily responsibilities of police department staff. And uh, they have the opportunity to ask questions, 
discuss the issues that are going on, view demonstrations, and experience a variety of training that our, our staff go through. Uh, part of that is uh, they get to go on a ride along uh, with our officers and also sit along with our dispatchers. Uh, that, uh, uh, that, that uh, community of police experience group will be graduating here in May. And um, again, we uh, put these on a couple times a year. So uh, continue to uh, 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 watch our social media for uh, the next one uh, in the future. Related to that, we are planning our uh, community police experience with youth uh, uh, in June or July. It's going to be this summer. Uh, this is something that we do once a year. It's a week-long uh, community police experience, and uh, we take uh, you know juniors and seniors from uh, our local uh, lo local schools, uh, and uh, we put them through a truncated process and uh, uh, experience, which has been very successful in the past. So we're we're currently planning that, and uh, our community engagement team is uh, uh, working on uh, putting that together. <clears throat> Uh, one of the uh, uh, one of the exciting things I wanted to tell you about is this week is Volunteer Appreciation Week. Uh, we have a program called VIPS, uh, Volunteers and Police Services. Uh, our VIPS program, uh, we cannot do our community police experience um, and several other things without the help of our VIPS. And I wanted to give them a quick shout out. Uh, our VIPS are graduates of our police uh, experience program. Uh, they help out with our current uh, program now. We have 20 volunteers that help in a variety of different areas. Uh, the first area is patrol. And um, since uh, in the first quarter of 2022, our VIPs have worked over 368 hours in the field. Um, uh, I, I'm sorry, uh, total, our VIPs have worked 368 hours. That's a savings of over $23,000 for the city. Uh, the patrol VIPs have recorded 290, over 290 hours and 48 shifts uh, in, in uh, the patrol areas dealing with uh, traffic related issues uh, and vacation checks uh, and uh, helping out with community engagement. Our support VIPs internally, uh, they help us out with uh, paperwork and administrative duties, missing, uh, missing persons and work in a variety of assignments inside the department. And they've worked over 75 hours uh, to assist us with uh, providing service to our community. So we really wanna thank them. And uh, we, we also encourage uh, uh, members of the community who wanna do, uh, who wanna volunteer and give back uh, to, uh, to look at uh, our VIPS program. Uh, it's very exciting and uh, just a great opportunity to give back. Uh, the, the fire chief mentioned their work in uh, Seed Collaborative. We are also continuing our work with Seed Collaborative on our equitable policing plan. Uh, we have two groups, an external and an internal group, and uh, they're looking at several different areas. Uh, we're working with community members uh, on, on these groups. And uh, the, some of the areas that we're looking at are uh, recruitment, community engagement, community partnerships, uh, community culture and history. Uh, we're uh, looking into promotions and mentorship, policies and procedures, uh, internal communication and resources, and, and uh, internal culture and belonging. So uh, a lot of work going on there. Uh, and again, the community is involved um, in that area, and uh, we're working towards uh, recommendations, uh, which will be coming forward uh, to City Council in the near future. Uh, finally, I wanted to let uh, the community know that uh, we are uh, uh, we will be releasing our annual report, which will be for 2021. Uh, that report will be out in early May. Uh, it's going to include uh, statistical information, include highlights uh, on our strategic plan and what we've done, and also goals for the next year. Uh, we will let the community know through our social media. Um, when it's out and how to access it on our website. So uh, just a quick run through of some of the exciting things that are going on and um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Chief. Um, Council Member Rogers, do you have any questions? Um, well, one, I wanted to uh, give a, a shout out to the VIPs. Um, I know when I first came onto Council, I was 
bummed out because of COVID that they were not um, active because they cannot be um, as active as they wanted to be and expand um, the program. So I'm definitely happy to hear that they're active and getting um, more people um, into the program. And thank you very much for all that um, they're doing out in the community. Um, also, I wanted to know about um, whether or not the coffee with a cop would be on the City Connect um, if people were not on um, your social media page. That might be a good way if it has not preview, previously been on. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it it mm -hmm. is, we do put it on the City Connections. Um, uh, and, Anything that involves the community uh, goes on our social media, our website, and then we also uh, will include that. We work very closely with our uh, marketing team for the city uh, to make sure those things are on there. Okay, but, and um, the junior and seniors um, for that experience in the summer, uh, are there specific schools that are targeted or how, are, how is that open to our local juniors and seniors? So we, uh, we work with uh, the local high schools. So we both, uh, both with the Roseland School District and the uh, Santa Rosa School District. Uh, we, we push that out with them and with our uh, nonprofit partners to let, uh, uh, let the youth know that it's available. Uh, we do have limited uh, availability. So we can't, you know, uh, especially as we're still working through some of the final you know, restrictions with COVID. So uh, we do limit the number of people. Um, so it is an application process, but we do encourage our, uh, our youth to, uh, to sign up. So it does go through the schools and we work with them on, on getting that information out. Um, and then lastly, I wanted to ask uh, just a couple of questions about um, in response and I could hold off on that until we have a specific update about in response or it's it's up to you though. Uh, well, I, we do have uh, Captain John Cregan on, uh, on, on this right now. So uh, we could probably provide some information. Um, if we're looking for data or statistical information, I think it's more about, you know, we could probably wait till the uh, informational meeting that's coming up in May, but uh, uh, Captain Cregan would be happy to share whatever you, um, share anything that he has. Um, no data or specific information, um, but uh, specific information that maybe uh, would be beneficial or that I would like to, to know is um, the in response team is responding to welfare calls. Um, and we, we all know that sometimes welfare calls do not end. Um, the way we would like them to end. That's why they are welfare calls. Um, and being a clinician myself, um, I wanted to know if the welfare calls uh, are, are not a happy ending um, or maybe someone just couldn't get a hold of someone. Um, what do we have in place to uh, assist support um, our, the team members that are on the in response team? such as debriefings or how much time do they have in between calls, um, things like that. Because we have such a great program going and uh, within the field, I see a lot of burnout. So I just wanna make sure that we have the proper, you know, what we need for that team to continue to have what they need to refresh um, and to keep doing this wonderful work that we need in the community. Um, so I just wanted to bring that up. Yeah, and that's a great question. I just met with our program manager, Katie Swan, on Friday on that specific issue. So they have unfortunately had that where they've done welfare checks already and found people who are unfortunately deceased and had taken their lives. And that's a traumatic event for all involved. So we're working on a plan. So it's a little bit different since they're all by different, they're contracted employees. And so we have a system in the city of Santa Rosa where we have critical stress debriefs and we have uh, therapists who are uh, employee assistance program. So we're talking, we're, we're going to meet with our team about how we can make some of those resources available or be able to work with them because they are members of our, uh, our city of Santa Rosa family is, and we want to make sure they have the resources. So that's something that we're working on a plan and we just met on Friday about that 
And we're gonna, we have a in response steering committee of executives from each one of these organizations. So we have that on our next agenda, which we're meeting uh, next month, but that's, it's important for us. And, but we're gonna be getting out there. And then one piece of clarification, the community meeting is gonna be on Monday, May 9th is for the community meeting. So we'll be putting that on city connections on our social media. So it's Monday, May 9th at 4 p.m. via Zoom. And it's, it's our first meeting, what we call our community advisory group. And we're going to be presenting out on the first three months of data uh, from the in-response team, how the team's being deployed, where in the city, what are their highest level of calls. And then we're also going to give the update on rolling out the exciting second part of the team, which would be going from a coverage of 15 hours a day from 7 a.m. till 10 p.m. at night. And so that Monday, May 9th will be an important meeting to get the word out and we'll be sharing it on all of our platforms. Perfect. And I'm, I'm sure I've told you because I'm so excited about uh, the in response team, but um, I've heard nothing but wonderful things about the in response team and the wonderful work that they are providing to our community members. So um, thank you so much to everyone that has worked to get the in response team out there um, and on the streets. They're doing a terrific job. So um, I, I know they're doing very hard work and I just want to acknowledge um, the work that they are doing and to keep them healthy mentally and, and physically to continue to do the work. So thank you. Absolutely. Thanks for, for all your guys' support for getting the team off the ground. Thank you. I, I too share council member Rogers, um, you know, satisfactions and concerns around um, those issues that was related to in response. So with that, we will now go to public comment on item 5.2. Do we happen to have any raised hands? I'm looking here. I don't see any raised hands. Oh, I see one. All right, so we'll go to Iquavas. Um, can you, you've got three minutes. Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Irma Cuevas. I'm the wraparound coordinator for the Violence Prevention Partnership. And I'm sorry, I didn't catch the name of the point of contact. I run a lot, of, I work with a lot of youth and families and I'm always looking for teen programs. And I didn't catch the name of the point of contact for the youth police community program and also the fire um, program. I went on the websites and I couldn't find a point of contact. And I can look that elsewhere. I don't want to take up too much time, but if somebody could repeat it, I'll just jot it down really quick. Thank you. Thank you. We can't get into a back and forth, but I will ask your questions after we're done with the public comment. So do we have any um, pre-recorded public comment? There are no pre-recorded public comments. Okay. Um, I'll ask uh, the chiefs to respond to those two questions about point of contacts. Uh, so I'll go. Uh, I'll go first for the youth community uh, police experience. Uh, we have. Uh, uh, you can contact our lieutenant uh, in charge of our community engagement team, and that is Lieutenant Janine Cooker. Uh, her email is, uh, I believe, it's J Cooker. So it's J K U C K E R at srcity.org. And uh, again, we'll be putting the information out on our social media when it's. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm getting a correction here. It's J.R. Cooker, J-R-K-U-C-K-E-R at srcity.org. Um, and then we'll be putting information out to our social media. Uh, and then uh, we'll also be working with the Office of Community Engagement uh, to make sure that you have that information. Thank you. And any communication that needs to be filtered down can go directly through me, so ask Westro at srcity.org, and I'll send it to the appropriate strategy lead. So for the Youth Explorer program, it'd be Engineer Pat Bradley, and for the uh, community engagement piece, it would be Captain Corey Rickert. So, um, but it can come directly to me and I will filter it down appropriately and put you in touch with the right person. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, so with that, we will move on to item 5.3. Um, with Cat, the Lieutenant Dan Marenchik. Um, This is about military equipment. Morning, uh, council members and members of the community. So I'm here today to talk about Assembly Bill 41, which relates to military 
equipment and use. Um, I don't know if we're able to put up the slideshow that I have, it might make it a little bit easier. You can go to the next slide. So assembly bill, I'm gonna start, I'm gonna give a, a brief background and synopsis about this. And then um, some of the things the Santa Rosa Police Department has done. Uh, assembly bill 41, it's a bill that was signed into law last year by the California legislature. And what it does is it looks at things deemed military equipment. And the whole purpose of this bill, it's really to promote transparency, accountability, um, and oversight. Really kind of the basics of what is it that the police department has that's deemed military equipment? How are we using it? How much of it do we have? Um, you know, with the whole, the whole point to just safeguard the citizens of the community and so the, the community knows what it is that we are using and what we have. Uh, next slide, please. So these are some of the requirements that 41 put into place. So one of the first requirements is that we need to draft a policy and complete an inventory of our items. And we need to post that online 30 days prior to a public meeting or a full council public meeting. So our plan for this currently is we're in the process of working through our policy, finalizing our policy, finalizing our inventory. And we hope to post this within the next two weeks um, on our website and through various methods um, prior to our, our full council meeting. And then, so if you look down further, it talks about some of these things that this policy needs to do. So we need to go before the whole city council with this policy, as well as with a military ordinance. Um, and that needs to get approved by council. And these are some of the things that the policy needs to put in place or needs to um, spell out. We need to have this policy, how the equipment is being used. So when we talk about how the equipment is used, what is the capability of the equipments? What is the usage of the equipments? What type of training goes into um, this equipment that we're using? In this policy, we need to put about what are the maintenance costs and the use costs. So when we purchase one of these items that's military equipment, we need to put in there how much that's costing us. Not only that initial cost, but if there's any ongoing costs as with maintenance or training related to it. Um, next up is, is quantity possessed. So we need to conduct detailed inventories of every item we have that's deemed military equipment, which I'm going to get into a little bit further what that is. Um, detail what it is and how much we, how much we have. Um, and with that goes internal audits. We need to make sure that we're constantly auditing this, auditing this in our inventory that we have. And one of the other things that goes with this when we talk about putting a policy and ordinance in place is after this goes before the city council um, for approval, Every subsequent year after that, we need to come up with an annual report or put together an annual report um, that talks about the equipment we have, how we used it, um, any complaints or issues that arose from the equipment. And after we do that, we will hold a community meeting, at least one community meeting, and really solicit public feedback um, regarding any complaints, issues, or concerns for this. And really, our hope for, for part of this presentation is really just to kind of spur that dialogue and um, see what it is or what input, what feedback the community has. Um, if there's issues and concerns going forward, things that we can look at and that we can address before we do put this policy into place. Next slide, please. So AB 41, the law that was signed into place, it deems 15 categories that it, that it deems are military equipments. And so one of the, the um, things to note here is that when it uses the term military equipment, it doesn't necessarily need to be things that are purchased from the military or used by the military. It is stuff that within this law, the, the law deems it as military equipment, whether it's obtained from the military or not. So therefore it is something that applies or AB 41 applies to. So we conducted a, uh, an inventory, kind of an audit with the police department of all the items that we have to see what is it that we have that falls under these categories or these 15 categories. And through that, we found that of those 15 categories, we have eight categories where we have some items that would fall under the 41 category. And I'm gonna talk about those in the next couple of slides. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a list of the eight categories of equipment that we have within the police department. And I'll, again, I'll talk about them in a little bit further detail um, and what they are, why we use them, why we have them. So projectile launchers, flashbang grenades, tear gas, command and control vehicles, the long range acoustic device, specialized firearms um, and ammunition that are outside of what we normally issue to officers, armored personnel car uh, carriers, battering rams, uh, unmanned aerial or ground vehicles. Next slide, please. So that first category that I talked about is projectile launchers. And what these are is 
these are those less lethal launchers that we have. Um, and they allow officers to use chemical agents or kinetic energy pro uh, projectiles and launch them from these platforms. And one of the reasons why we have these is it allows officers to deploy them from a greater distance. So it gives us an alternative option um, rather than using a higher level of force. And so one of the things where we look about how do we de-escalate a situation or how do we keep um, an officer from using a higher level of force, there's a few concepts that we follow. Um, and one of them is distance and time. And so the concept behind that is if we're able to give an officer further distance from somebody um, that they don't have to engage with them right away, or we're able to provide more time, one of the things that studies show is that lowers our use of force or the, or the use of a higher level of force. So these are different options that we have as opposed to um, lessening that distance, lessening that amount of time where we can engage somebody or talk to somebody or deal with an individual from a further distance away and from a safer distance away. So with these projectile launchers, the piece of equipment that we have is a 40 millimeter launcher. And that's something that falls under projectile launchers. That's something that's equipped in every patrol vehicle. And there's sponge rounds or less lethal rounds that officers have that they can deploy from these. I'm um, additionally just to note when we conducted this audit of projectile launchers, we actually um, we use this opportunity to look at other items that we have as there, if there's things that we can purge from our inventory or that we no longer need. And we actually um, identified two other less lethal devices that we had that we no longer needed at the police department just because of the, the replacement of 40 millimeters into our, um, our inventory. So those items have uh, been removed from our inventory. All the munitions have been removed from our inventory. Next slide, please. Uh, the next category we have is chemical munitions and diversionary devices. So these are items, it includes flashbangs and what we call CS gas. So what a flashbang is, it's, it's a distraction device. Um, when you deploy it, it makes a loud noise and there's a bright light. And so it's used to distract or disorient somebody. Um, these are used only by our SWAT team and they're used during high risk situations um, when they would need to use these devices. They're not used outside of the SWAT team. With chemical agents, um, we use those in both our SWAT and both our mobile field force teams. So depending on which team it is, there's different situations they can use them for. For our SWAT team, they use them during high risk search warrants, arrest warrants, um, critical type of incidents where they need to either help remove somebody from an area. So as opposed to going into an area to remove them, they use a chemical agent to remove them from that area and try to gain compliance or to keep somebody from going to the area. And they use that as opposed to using a higher level force um, to really keep the situation from escalating um, and for the safety or resolution of the incident. And then for our mobile field force, they use chemical agents um, in riotous situations where they need to use those to deploy a crowd in uh, opposed to using some other type of force situation. And so I talked about this category, the two main things in this category are flashbangs and CS gas that fall within this category. Um, again, with this is we, we took this opportunity when, when we went through this inventory our items to see what it is that we have, what it is that we currently um, need, what it is we can get rid of. So when we first did this inventory, we had approximately 28 different items of chemical agents or uh, chemical munitions or diversionary devices. So through this process, we've actually um, purge 10 of these items for our inventory, either dispose of them, give them to other agencies, um, gotten rid of them. And then we're looking to see if there's anything additional that we can remove from our inventory. Uh, next slide, please. Command and control vehicles. This is also something that falls within the AB 41 category. So what command and control vehicles are is I just kind of equate them to their, their big vehicles that we have, but we have the ability to set up what we call a mobile dispatch. So there's somebody inside of those vehicles who can help dispatch direct um, different units or different officers or any resources that we have within the police department or even other agencies that we're working with. Um, so we use these for special events, large events, um, critical incidents, um, you know, natural disasters. And really the benefit for us using this is when you have a command, we make a command area that's close to the incident that is occurring, it allows us to get that real-time information more quickly um, it allows us to communicate better, and that just allows us to make better decisions. So within this, we have um, one mobile command vehicle currently in our inventory that's over 20 years old. 
Um, so we do use that regularly. However, we are also in the process of attempting to purchase an additional smaller command vehicle in the future as this other mobile command vehicle that we currently have is outside of its lifespan. Uh, next slide, please. Long range acoustic device. So this is another item that we have uh, that falls within the AB 41 category. We possess one of these items within the police department. Um, we have recently gotten them within the last couple of years. And really the, the point of this is this is a communication device that we use. So we can use this for a whole multitude of situations, natural disasters, evacuations, protests, high risk search arrest warrants, uh, hostage barricade situations, search and rescues anything where we think that we need to be able to communicate better and communicate more effectively. And one of the things with this, this long range acoustic device is it, it focuses the direction of the sound waves so you can actually hear things more clearly, more audible and at a greater distance than any other piece of equipment that we have. Um, we'd previously given a presentation before the public safety subcommittee about this long range acoustic device in the past. One of the concerns that had come up from the community was the use of what is called a warning tone on the LRAD, and that is, a, that is an audible button. If you press, it would emit a high-pitched tone um, from the long-range acoustic device. And that's something that we have disabled and we can no longer, or we no longer use on our long-range acoustic device. So it's been permanently disabled as well as put into the policy that it shall never be used. Uh, next slide, please. Specialized firearms and ammunition. Again, this is another category where we have items that fall within the AB 41 threshold. Um, these specialized firearms, these are things that are used by our, our special tactical team, our SWAT team. So they have a few um, firearms that fall outside the scope of normal duty issued firearms. And there's really two things that they have. They have uh, SWAT has specialty rifles that are not standard duty issued rifles that normal patrol officers would have. Um, with that comes specialty ammunition for it. And they also have, um, we have a sniper team associated or, or attached to our SWAT team, and they have a Long range, longer range rifle, which is a, a sniper rifle, which allows them to have a greater distance um, in order to deploy that if they were to ever need to. So the, the point for having these, the reason why we have these on our teams is rifles are a more precision guided um, weapon. They're more accurate, they're more efficient. You can deploy them at greater distances. So depending on how far away a SWAT team, if they were ever need to engage somebody, um, the greater the distance, they have more accuracy so not only are they gonna have a better shot placement, but that also really minimizes the risk to the public because in the unfortunate event you would need to fire rounds, you wanna obviously do that as accurately as you possibly can and really minimize that risk to the public. And the difference between accuracy, between a handgun um, as opposed to a rifle and the range is really astronomical. Uh, next slide, please. Armored rescue vehicle. So this is something that also falls within the category, we actually don't possess one of these items at the Santa Rosa Police Department. However, um, through a memorandum of understanding with our Sheriff's Office, we do use this item. It is something that is used by our tactical team, by our SWAT team. And really what it is, is they use it to provide protection. So it's a, it's a big piece of equipment that's bulletproof um, or bullet resistant. And it's really to provide that protection to officers and citizens in a case there is some real critical incident um, whether a, a active shooter situation, a high risk arrest warrant, a high risk search warrant, some type of hazardous situation where either officers or people in the public need that protection from um, some type of uh, round or some type of uh, ballistic protection. Um, it can also be used as a rescue vehicle, right? So in the event that we have an active shooter or we have an officer down, that piece of equipment can allow officers to safely or more safely evacuate people and get them the medical attention and get them the medical care that they need. And then just a thing to note, one of the things when you look at armored rescue vehicles, there's really a wide gamut of what armored rescue vehicles are considered throughout the country. Um, you have things from where you do have former military surplus vehicles used in other parts of the country. Um, however, the one that we use um, within a joint agreement with the sheriff's office, it's a civilian vehicle. So it really is just a, a reinforced Ford F-550 pickup truck with ballistic protection on it. Uh, next slide, please. Breaching apparatuses. So what a breaching apparatus is, is it's something that allows an officer to make entry, um, whether into a residence, an outbuilding, something where we need to get entry either through a door or some other way you can enter the building. With 41, we have one thing that falls under breaching apparatuses because it's, it's deemed explosive breaching. 
Um, and what that is, is they're breaching shotgun rounds. So what those are, are those are small clay rounds that go within a, a shotgun round and an officer who is specially trained can use that round if there's a deadbolt on a locking door, um, they can use that round to disable that deadbolt and make entry. So the range of those is very limited. Um, they're designed obviously just to impact that lock. Um, they don't have an extended range to minimize the, the, the uh, or maximize the safety to civilians or other people who um, might be present during a situation like this. And again, there's specialty training that goes into that. And this isn't something that an officer would use at every time. This is something where, again, it's possessed by our, our specialty tactical team, our SWAT team, um, where they need to make that quick entry into a building or a residence um, because they think that there might be some imminent risk of injury to somebody else inside. Uh, next slide, please. And then unmanned aerial or ground systems. So drones and robots. Um, we have, a, we have a numerous drones in, in our fleet, um, and then we have one robot. And really the, the point is I talked about before about really how important distance and time is. Um, so we really have multiple situations where we can use drones and robots. So drones, they're used by our drone operators who go through special training. Um, they're actually licensed to use these drones. And really the, the benefit for this is just allows us to see areas or view areas that we wouldn't normally be able to see. Not only that, um, you know, it, it can allow us to go or look at a situation before we're actually in there to make sure, is it safe or is it as safe as can be? Or is it something where we need to delay going into uh, a, a delay making an entry into place because we think that there's some information we've received from this drone where it might actually benefit us and benefit the people there if, if we were to delay our entry. So we can use this for a lot of things. We've used these for missing people. Our, our um, SWAT team has used this before to gain information before they serve search warrants. We've used them to document crime scenes. Um, there's a whole multitude of situations that we, that we can use these for. Um, and then with the robot, we, we have one tactical robot within our SWAT team. That's used primarily just by our SWAT team or just by our SWAT team. And that's something, again, I talk about distance and time. So if there's a search warrant, an arrest warrant, where the SWAT team thinks it would benefit them to send in a robot first, which it often does, they can send that robot in and really get a picture of what it is they're going into before they go into it. And if they have that information, they're going to be able to make better decisions um, understand of is this the best situation to go in and make an entry into the house or should we delay and wait um, because of the information we've received from this robot. So we really use these for information, both drones and robots, and really to help guide our decision making with what it is um, that we do before we do it. And next slide. Um, so that's, that's it. That's really a, a quick brief rundown of what it is that we have, why we have it. Um, again, this is something that's going to go before the, the full council, but really our hope is, is from this public safety subcommittee is really just get that input and feedback, both from, from you council members, and even to spur that conversation, that discussion with our community. You know, if there is questions, if there is input, if there is concerns, if there's stuff that we can use to guide this policy going forward, because nothing is, is finalized yet, right? We're just working on putting together our draft and we definitely wanna take into account all the input from, from you, from the community as we go forward and move forward with this. Um, so that's, that's really all I have. I don't know if there's any specific questions related to um, any of the categories or the policy or process. Thank you, Lieutenant. Um, Council Member Rogers, questions, comments? Question, yes. Um, how, how many um, people are trained to be on the SWAT, are trained to be SWAT? Am I asking you right? Trained no, you, you SWAT are. SWAT member? Are. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you are. Um, so we currently have, I believe there's 18 SWAT members and three supervisors for that team. And then on top of that, there's one Lieutenant who manages that whole program. Okay, because I noticed many, many things that you went over, they were specific to SWAT training, which would be additional hours of, of training. It is, yes. A, a lot of this stuff does, it just pertains to our SWAT team there's additional training. So with these, all these members on the SWAT team, um, there's a, a higher level of training that they receive. So before you can even be a part of the SWAT team, there is a, a post-approved two-week SWAT school that you have to go to. Um, a lot of these items, there's specific training associated with those items that you need to do. Um, and then also our SWAT team, they receive more ongoing training as opposed to our regular patrol teams. So in addition, they train two days extra or two days a month 
um, throughout the course of the year. So for approximately 24 trainings a year that they are uh, training where they're going over these items um, through practical applications or through testing processes. Yeah, I, I'm not sure about uh, Chair Fleming, but I, for me, it's important to kind of know what, what SWAT was. Like I, I know what it is from uh, television and, and uh, movies, but really that, you know, they go through specialized training and ongoing training and um, why it is that they would be able to use um, these devices um, more so than anyone else. Um, yeah, that's, that's a, a, good, a good question. And, and one of the things of um, as we finalize this policy, so what you're going to see with this policy as it goes forward too is each one of these categories, it's a pretty lengthy policy. There's a capability, a usage, and a training section built into each, into each of these categories. So as you look at this, you're going to see in more detail than the brief synopsis that I gave of, of what it's used for, what are some of the legal and policy requirements that go into that in order to use it. And then what are some of the retraining requirements, whether it's mandatory training requirements, essential training requirements, what you need to do to be able to deploy, um, deploy these devices. So there will be some more detail on that as, as the pol in the policy as it moves forward. And then lastly, is SWAT called in or is there always a portion of the 18 on duty? That's a, that's a good question. Um, so it depends on the it depends on the circumstances. So I'd say there's there's really two reasons that we would deploy a SWAT team. Um, well, you could say three, but an emergency event. So if something happens, rather a call for service, and we need to get everybody there immediately. So uh, you know you look in a situation. Let's say you have a shooting, and um, the su the individual who's the suspect got in a vehicle pursuit, and then they you know they got out of the car and they ran into an area. That's an emergency situation where we would call on that SWAT team in order to help locate that person and take that person into custody. Um, the other event, it's a pre-planned operation. So it's something where they have the benefit of time and they can put together a tactical plan. So sort of an example I would use for that is let's say um, our violent crimes team, they've done a, conducted a homicide investigation and they've identified the person, they've located them, and then they bring all that information to SWAT and they're like, hey, put together a plan to take this person into, into safely into custody. So then SWAT has that time in order to develop that plan um, and then serve that, serve that warrant. So the way it's kind of staffing works right now is a lot of our SWAT team, they are actually assigned to patrol. So as some of these events unfold, um, they will be the ones who are naturally responding to these more higher risk um, type of events, and they'll go to them immediately. Um, we try to, whether it's a whatever SWAT deployment we do, they, we try to deploy as many SWAT officers to effectively solve the situation. So there's times where there might be a SWAT deployment, and they can safely and successfully resolve that incident with just the officers that are in patrol. Or there might be situations where we need to call in additional bodies, whether they're not working that day, whether assigned to a different assignment, um, and they will call in those bodies to, to solve the problem. Okay, I think that answered my question. They're assigned to patrol. Mo so most they're not they're not just like SWAT and they don't do anything else. No, it's not a it's it's not a full-time assignment here at the police department. It's what we call a, a collateral assignment. So for SWAT, they have that assignment, but they have their primary duties, which come first before their, their SWAT assignment. Thank you very much for helping me to figure that out. <laughs> yeah, that was really um, helpful. Thank you, Councilmember Rogers, for those questions and excellent answers, Lieutenant. My, um, I, have, I, don't have a, I don't have a question. What I have is a comment, which is I think that part of this process that will be really helpful, and I think that we, this, this is a, good bite into it today is clarifying what it is that we have and under what circumstances it's used and that the police department has thought through carefully about the community's concerns about the potential for these things being misused um, by accident or, um, or other circumstances and that has taken reasonable precautions to prevent those types of unfortunate incidences. And so I think that going forward, you know, this is this is really helpful. And I know that oftentimes we don't want to have too much detail because, 
you know, you get down into the weeds, but I think that having detail and, and being, or being prepared to, to answer these questions in the kind of detail that you did in particular with council member Rogers' questions around the SWAT team will be really helpful going forward to um, assure the public that we've thought through all of the issues that we're aware of and are doing our best to make sure that things don't go sideways. So that's my, my comment and my concern. So with that, we will take public comment. Do we, I see one hand raised um, from Evan. Can we unmute Evan? Are you able to hear me? Indeed. Thank you. Um, just contextually, I would like to point out that as a nation, uh, we spend more money on our domestic law enforcement than any other nation in the world spends on its entire military. So that's a key thing to understand uh, as an overview and also contextually point out the recent settlements the city has had in the millions for SRPD's misuse of military equipment. So this is not abstract uh, in any way. This is not just a, a state thing coming a, a law that's being mandated, but it's very real here in this community. And I have some comments and questions that I would hope uh, you know, representatives would follow up on, as I know this is not a back and forth, but you know, he mentioned there were two uh, projectiles that were removed. What are they specifically? Uh, why were they removed? And were those used in past protests? Um, also contextually, using any form of chemical agent or gas on civilians is largely considered a human rights violation by uh, most international standards. And I think that's very important to consider again. We had 28 items he identified in our gas and chemical inventory. That's, could we get the detail on those 28? It sounds like 10 were purged. Uh, what were those by name? Why were they purged? Um, which were kept and why were they kept? Also, I'd like to say it's very disingenuous to represent LRADs as primarily a communication device. Historically, their primary function is as a, a torture weapon. So I am encouraged uh, that we permanently disabled the warning tone but I would just like to know who's verified outside of SRPD that that has been permanently disabled and how was it permanently disabled? Also just psychologically, it's interesting that your presentation would mention rescue vehicles and mention rescuing officers in dire need or duress ahead of civilians. That's very odd to me. Um, regarding drones, is the city going to create policy that bans facial recognition technology used on our drones and robots and in general, and I also want to know if the drones are used in private areas without a warrant or just using public uh, space. Um, and then also lastly here, according to our own Pentagon, FBI, uh, et cetera, the largest threat that we have here domestically is armed white militia nationalist group, as we saw uh, partially in the January 6th uh, insurrection and relating to military weapons. I'd like to know if any members of Santa Rosa Police Department are affiliated with any other militia groups and if that's been investigated and if, if not, why that wouldn't be investigated, knowing that that is, again, not abstract, but our own military deems that the largest threat, which also creates some contradictory concerns because as a community member who is part of a lot of the activists and, and protest scene, we want these uh, sort of oversights in place for civilian safety. But ironically, some of these military tools may need to actually be used against violent insurrectionists, as I can assure you, the BLM and social justice community is not interested in violence. We are not going to ever pose that sort of threat to the police department. So I know I just threw a lot out there. Um, I hope some of that could be followed up on now or uh, in, in the Thank near you. future. Thank you. I will, um, I will ask some of those questions when we're done with public comment. So now we have, um, uh, phone number ending in 0694. Hi, this is Jim Duffy, uh, Chair Fleming and Councilman Rear Rogers. Thank you for taking my comments today. I'm an oversight practitioner at Aroner Park. Uh, I want to thank the Lieutenant for his excellent presentation. Um, it is unfortunate that the draft policy was not able to be brought before this important subcommittee. And there needs to be a hearing on the actual draft policy before this subcommittee, before that draft policy is brought to the city council, in my opinion. 
um, because that that's where the rubber hits the road is when we're looking at the actual policy rather than this process discussion that occurred today. Um, but it's good to have the process discussion. Uh, one of the things I suggest that the uh, subcommittee and the council get from the police department is details of the usage of all of this equipment over the last 10 years so that you can really see how often it's used and to what benefit and what effect um, so you can decide what you want to keep and what you don't. Uh, the policy should detail permitted and prohibited uses of each individual type of equipment. There should be no language that uh, says the uses include but are not limited to and then lists some uses because if you're not going to limit them, uh, then they're open for usage. However, people might decide and, you know, a probationary officer is very likely to, to make a mistake if they're not uh, given specific uses and prohibited uses. And then my last point right now, because we don't really have a policy to dig into, is uh, do you want to allow military equipment to be used for public relations purposes? Uh, I've got pictures that I really like kids in the armored personnel carriers of the sheriff's office. But I also kind of feel weird and not sure whether that was a good use of it. Um, and so that's a discussion that I think the council should be having. Thank you for taking my comments. Thank you, Mr. Duffy. And I do hope you participate when we have this um, item come before us again, whether it's here at the, the full council, raise some great points. Okay, do we have any pre-recorded public comment? There are no pre-recorded public comments. Okay, so now um, we'll go back to staff and see if we can get some answers to some of the questions raised. Um, I know that these are broad in scope, but they are important. Um, could you address first um, why the projectiles were removed? Yes, yeah, so there was approximately actually, um, 10 different between projectiles and chemical agent munitions that are removed. So there's a multitude of reasons um, dependent on them. So some of them were of redundancy. So with this policy, we need to spell out the specific manufacturer and model number. So there are actually multiple different manufacturers that create less lethal devices. So some of these are, you have one manufacturer making this, another one making this. And so for the sake of consistency and making sure we just have one munition, we, we purge one of those manufacturers, kept the other. Um, some of the stuff it's, we evaluate our inventory and it's, they're all used in a different context or a different situation. So when we went through our inventory for some of this stuff, um, it, it was, well, we have two things that are very similar, let's say. So I'll use, for example, um, a less lethal round, right? So we have um, two that were similar, right? Different manufacturers. Um, one, the effective range is a little bit different than the other one. So, so we really just kind of evaluated that using our instructors we have in house, getting feedback from different officers, different people that are part of these tactical teams. And um, for so for an effective range, it's well, we have one that maybe will meet this effective range, the other one will meet this effective range, even though they're a little bit different. Do we need both? If that makes sense. We can fulfill most of our needs just using this one round. So I don't know if that makes sense. Um, how I'm trying to explain it or not, but that's that's another situation there that went in there or into our consideration for why we remove stuff. Um, and that's, that's just it, stuff that we've looked at our inventory and it's okay, we've had this, um, we, we've had these in our inventory for 20 years, have we, ever, have we ever used these? Do we ever think there's gonna be a need to use these? And so there might've been a situation where it's, no, we don't need to. So let's remove those from our, from our inventory. We don't see a need where we actually will need to use this. So those are some of the things. Um, as we finalize the inventory and come out with it, um, we can definitely um, talk about, or if the conversation wants to happen as to why each individual one was removed, we can talk about the actual decision-making process behind each individual munition or round that we removed um, as our finalized inventory list does come out. Okay, thank you. And can you speak to the permanent disablement of the, um, the, the LRAD? Yeah, so the, so the warning tone, that, that high-pitched tone that you hear in the LRAD, it's, what it is is, it, the LRAD's a big, um, best way to say a big speaker 
and there's, uh, gosh, I'm, I'm showing my age, MP3 player or a little player that can connect to the LRAD. So what that warning tone is, that's a pre-recorded sound made by the manufacturer. And, it, and so when you play it through the LRAD, it emits the, that high pitched um, sound. So to remove that process, it went through a couple of different things. Um, obviously we put in our policy that should never be used. And then that actual sound file has been removed um, from that device. So if you plug it in, it's no longer there. So you're not able in the field to put that sound out there. So you're, you're unable to actually make that sound. So that was a process that went through it. All that, that warning sound is it's an electronic file. It's been removed, it's been purged. We no longer have it. Um, so we can no longer play that sound um, through our system. And then just a thing to note with, with the LRAD, um, you know, I, I can't stress enough the importance of it as an effective communication tool. These are things, especially during the times of evacuations and fires, you see a lot of local fire agencies, um, you know, even in Marin County setting up stationary LRADs throughout to help you use for evacuation purposes. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then on the facial recognition, um, is, is that something that we do with our drones? Um, no, that is not a, a process that we do not use facial recognition in any form within the police department right now. Um, that is not a, a policy or a process for us. And there's also some legislation in the state right now to further kind of restrict that. However, it's something that the Santa Rosa Police Department doesn't currently use or are going to use facial recognition. Okay. And um, there was another question about uh, drone usage and warrants on private property. It depends on the, um, it depends on the situation. So if it's something open to public view, um, we will use the drone, but when you see drones using these tactical operations, so such as a search warrant or an arrest warrant, those are things that we have warrants for um, when we use them in those tactical operations. But there are situations such as a missing person. If, if we think somebody's missing in a public area, um, we will use those, those drones. But we don't, and we don't just use drones for pure surveillance principle. There, there's an identifiable need as to why we need to use that drone. So you, will, you don't see us just up and flying a drone in a designated area to see what is going on. That's all part um, in our policy. It talks about the actual restrictions to what our drone use is. Mm -hmm. And then I think the final question and the, um, that I'm going to ask, um, I'll leave the rest to the, the broader council because I think they're policy um, points that were raised by the commenters. But the last question I'll ask is, um, is what, um, if anything, have we done to um, ensure that our police officers are not members of white militia groups. And I don't know if the chief wants to weigh in on that. That might be more. Yeah. So um, yeah. Um, so Chair Fleming, we uh, we do a um, we do a thorough background process for all of our staff members who are employed by the city of Santa Rosa uh, Police Department. And um, we are, if, if there's a, a complaint or a concern about uh, potential association or affiliation with a particular group, uh, we will conduct an, uh, an internal investigation or an administrative investigation to, um, to, to see if there's any uh, uh, validity to that. So um, if, if something like that comes up, we definitely look into it. We do have a whole uh, process uh, as you know, we do work with um, the uh, the police auditor, and you're going to be hearing a little bit more about that. Um, and they would have uh, full access and information to those investigations. Uh, but uh, we do not have any uh, uh, staff members uh, that are affiliated with any known uh, violent extremist groups um, that we're aware of. Um, and I also want to just uh, point out that a lot of the uh, there there were some questions about. Uh, whether it was drones or uh, some of our less lethal, we do have in, uh, separate policies. We've actually brought forward some of these policies to the Public Safety Subcommittee in past, um, over the past few months. And if there's uh, more questions, we'd be happy to, um, uh, these policies are all accessible on our website. Uh, go to, if you go to our transparency page, and then um, if the Public Safety uh, or if the subcommittee uh, would like to uh, discuss more in depth any particular policies such as drones, we can definitely look at that in the future. Excellent. Thank you so much. And uh, um, a hearty thank you to you as well as the public for raising some really important points. So with that, I think that we are on to our final item, which is uh, the police auditor item. Oh, excuse me. Um, I spoke too fast. Councilmember Rogers. It's okay. Um, I just wanted to ask uh, Chief 
that is for the initial background for um, the groups. The question that Chair Fleming asked, that's for the initial background that is done during the hiring process, right? That's correct. We do a, a background process for the initial hire. Um, if there is a concern or a complaint that comes up, uh, then we uh, have a process in place to uh, conduct an investigation uh, to look at any type of affiliations. Um, there are uh, rules and uh, uh, privacy uh, issues that uh, you know prevent, I think, any uh, any employer to, to go into uh, uh, personal social media accounts. But uh, if we if we hear um, or we're, if there's a concern about a particular employee, we will look into that and um, uh, fully vet that out. And again, we work with that the outside auditor. Uh, if there's uh, any complaints like that, that may come up. Um, in, in addition to, I think that uh, some other the points were raised, uh, when the policy does come up uh, for usage, uh, past usage, if that can be um, brought forth, um, that would be good to give uh, background um, <clears throat> so that people know like well we don't use we don't really use this anyway or we have used this and it's useful um, and it's helped us um, or it's, we need it uh, although we use it very rarely it's still very helpful um, when we do need it um, because just because we have it doesn't mean that it's very widely used it could just be used um periodically um and um uses include but are not limited to i thought was a good issue brought up but because we don't have the policy we don't really in front of us we don't really know exactly what it's going to say yeah um and as to um you know, going back to what Lieutenant uh, Marinzik had uh, uh, discussed in the PowerPoint, we will be providing an annual report on our on, uh, on many of these areas, including use, uh, costs, how we use uh, how we've used the uh, the devices, or um, you know, and um, the the audits on uh, whether or not they're effective or not. So those those will be all included in annual reports. Great follow-up questions. Um, with that, I think we can close this item and move on to item 5.4, police auditor, which will be presented by Captain Ryan Corcoran. All right. So Nice to see everyone here. We actually made a, uh, a change. Lieutenant Brenda Harrington took over uh, my position in professional standards. And so if it's okay, um, she will do the report out. We will happily welcome uh, Lieutenant Harrington. Hello there, can you guys hear me? We can hear you, we can cannot... Perfect, hi, good morning. My name is Brenda Harrington, and I'm a lieutenant with the Santa Rosa Police Department's Professional Standards Team. Today, I'll be providing information about the Independent Police Auditor. And the next slide, please. On November 30th of 2021, the Santa Rosa City Council approved OAR Group LLC as the Independent Police Auditor, otherwise known as IPA. The auditor reports directly to the city manager and is under the operating authority of the city manager. There are 11 key scope of work areas already in place and or a timeline for implementation has been identified. Next slide, please. So with the 11 items of scope of work, the first is the review of the Santa Rosa Police Department's internal investigations and citizen complaints. OAR can participate in and review all internal investigations and citizen complaints. 
OER, OIR can attend interviews, ask questions directly, and assess credibility. Their second scope of work is the receipt of citizen complaints. SRPD created a process and OIR has access to all citizen complaints. OIR and the Santa Rosa Police Department's professional standards team meet via Zoom approximately every two weeks. The department website has been updated to reflect the independent police auditor and how to contact them directly. To date, they have had one community member contact them directly. Notification letters to the complainant include information that the independent police auditor has reviewed the incident. Next slide, please. The third scope of work is the notice of death, serious injury, or other critical incidents. The Santa Rosa Police Department had one case this year, and OIR was notified on the date of the incident and provided full details of what was known prior to the body worn camera being uploaded and the police report being written. And then they do have full access to that camera footage and the police report. Their fourth scope of work, the audit of Santa Rosa Police Department misconduct complaints in the discipline process. OAR has access to the Santa Rosa Police Department complaint database, which includes all records available to the professional standards team. In June of 2022 is an anticipated start date for a six month review. I would like to point out that OIR provides ongoing and regular review through those biweekly meetings and discussions. Next slide, please. Their fifth scope of work is the audit of Santa Rosa Police Department policies, procedures, and trainings. The starting review date for RIPA compliance and the bias evaluation is in June of 2022. Since OIR was not in contract until November 30th of 2021, they will have a year's worth of data to review by December of 2022. Therefore, in December of 2022 is when they will begin to review the data for the annual audit, use of force investigations, which includes taser usage and use of force aggregate data, the body-worn camera usage and use of, force, use of force reviews by supervisors and the professional standard team, along with policies, practices, and procedures related to legal mandates in the areas of use of force and equipment. Next slide, please. Their sixth scope of work is recommended changes, improvements to policy, procedure, or training to ensure the best equitable policing environment. Beginning in December of 2022, the OIR group will systematically review Santa Rosa Police Department's existing policies and procedures and evaluate new or changed Santa Rosa Police Department policies. They will systematically review the training program. The OIR group will make written recommendations to the police chief for improvements or changes to the Santa Rosa Police Department policy, procedure, or training regarding any matter. Their seventh scope of work is the production of reports, and that report will be completed annually beginning in March of 2023. Their eighth scope of work is the ability to conduct independent investigations. If the OIR group thinks an investigation is necessary and the Santa Rosa Police Department has not initiated one, they do have the authority through the city manager to initiate an investigation. Next slide, please. Their ninth scope of work is community outreach. OIR is to meet with various city and community stakeholders in an effort to seek input on policing issues that may arise. On April 20th of 2022, which is today, they will meet the CCAT team um, via Zoom. And in early summer of 2022, they will begin in-person visits to meet with stakeholders and participate in ride-alongs. The OIR group is responsible for having culturally and linguistically responsive staff to meet the community needs of the city. The OIR group does have a diverse staff and additional resources available to meet any needs of the city. Community meetings, which could include the community engagement team led by Magali Teas, will be facilitated by the mayor or his or her designee and held twice a year. These meetings will engage and inform residents in the role work and outcomes of the auditor. This will begin in the early summer of 2022. Next slide, please. 
The 10 scope of work is reporting responsibility. OIR will report directly to the city manager and will be under the operating authority of the city manager. Michael Janako of the OIR group met with the city manager on January 13th of 2022 and will continue to meet every three months. Meetings will happen more often when necessary. The 11 scope of work is what is an equity consultant. To assist with carrying out the scope of work, the independent police auditor, the OIR group, will contract with an equity consultant. The OIR group is currently in contract with Brian Core. Mr. Core is the executive director of police review and advisory board for the city of Cambridge, Massachusetts, and has over 30 years of experience. Brian Core is the immediate past president of NACL, which is the National Association for Civilian Oversight of Law Enforcement. And their website for more information on that organization is www.nacle.org. Next slide. And we just wanted the community to know that the Santa Rosa Police Department has a full-time sergeant and lieutenant, myself, dedicated to the professional standards team. All complaints are thoroughly investigated and reviewed by the professional standards team. To reach my team, the number is 707-543-3559, or an email can be sent to srpdinfo at src.org. Community members may pick up a complaint form in English or Spanish from either the upstairs or downstairs police department lobbies, or they may download a complaint form in English or Spanish from the department website. If a community member prefers to communicate with someone outside of the police department, they may contact the independent police auditor, the OAR group LLC at 323-412-0334. Next slide, please. And that's just um, a reiteration of the OIR group contact information. The phone number again is 323-412-0334 or www.oirgroup.com. Next slide. Thank you very much, Lieutenant. Um, do we have any questions from Council Member Rogers? Okay, um, thank you so much. This is really helpful information and we'll see who in the public has any questions or comments. I see that Evan has their hand raised. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right, thank you. Um, first, I just like the preface, what I have to say is that I'm not trying to uh, create any sort of hostile dynamic between the public and the police department, because I think many of us particularly appreciate the work that the professional standards uh, department does. And I know that people are genuinely and sincerely earnestly working uh, towards improving uh, community services and relations. Um, that said, I'm a little unclear why the police department is reporting on their own oversight. Is this just a clarification on what they do, which was been passed very well established? Because I'm very certain that people would much rather hear on record from OIR specifically. Um, and then this, I, I know I'm not supposed to mix agenda items here, but they do cross over into each other because a lot of the auditing concerns are about the previous item. And I would just like to point out that it's entirely insufficient um, when you do an initial background check for hiring and then rely on a complaint in order to do further investigation about people with affiliations with violent you know, militia or white nationalist groups when the very nature of those groups is sworn secrecy. And while I'm aware there are um, privacy and HR, HR laws uh, about, and it's not illegal to be a part of a militia, it is a violation of conduct code and policy to have sworn an oath, for example, to be an oath keeper, which local press Democrat is reported on how we have hundreds of members locally. Um, when you swear an oath to another uh, entity that supersedes your public service, that might not be unconstitutional, but it does indeed violate HR po uh, policy and is a, a fireable offense. So um, I, I will send, or we will find a way as a community to follow up on this as it's an OIR matter. I hope public standards is also taking it as seriously, but um, as much as these things are in place, the fact that you've had so few complaints is not because there aren't complaints. 
or that there's been just one request to the ORI group is that is still rooted in decades or centuries of distrust on the concept of calling the police on the police, even um, if it's an independent auditor, that is something that a lot of people still uh, distrust. So um, the other thing, uh, you know, I guess I, I, most of my questions, I assume somebody from OIR would be a part of this participation, even if SRPD was presenting. And I just find it a little bit conceptually odd. And I look forward to having more opportunity to engage with OIR about actual independent oversight because getting reporting, <laughs> reporting on who's having oversight over you is just a little bit of like a head scratcher to me. But um, thank you for the professional standards for the work that you do do. And uh, yeah, I relinquish the rest of my time. Thank you, Evan. And now we'll go to um, the number ending in 0694. Chair Fleming, Council Member Rogers, this is Jim Duffy. Thank you for taking my comments. I just have three quick comments. The first is on uh, the part receipt of citizen complaints. I'm looking at the uh, Santa Rosa Police Department webpage, and right on the front splash page, it says uh, instructions for citizen commendations or complaints. And it has absolutely no mention there that people can uh, submit commendations or complaints directly to OIR. So that needs, and they used to do that when we had Bob Aronson as the auditor. So that needs to be fixed uh, rather quickly because it's proven that a lot of people will not, uh, as Evan pointed out, want to contact law enforcement about complaints about law enforcement. So you need that right on the front page that, you know, if people have an issue or a compliment, they can also go directly to the auditor. Uh, my second uh, comment has to do with the quote unquote community outreach that is going to be done by going to the com chief's community ambassador team, which I'm, I know the people who are on that team are well-intentioned. But it, it really is a farce to have uh, a community group that's supposed to be providing some kind of oversight for the police who is appointed by the police chief and serve at the will of the chief of police. Uh, it's, it just violates the, the independent rule right there. And uh, for OIR to be saying, oh, we're going to do community outreach and we're going to talk to the people that the chief appointed. Uh, makes me very concerned that OIR has overextended themselves because they've been taking contracts all over the country lately because oversight is, you know, the hot thing. And, uh, you know, they've picked up Runner Park and Petaluma and Eureka and you guys. And I, I wonder if they're, they're, they've overextended themselves if they think that talking to CCAT is doing community outreach. You know, there are the NAACP, ACLU, North Bay Organizing Project, uh, La Luce, you know, there's so, Corazon, there's so many groups in this county that they should be talking to that are not appointed by the chief of police. Uh, and then my third comment is, is related to that. Uh, I've heard from many members of the city council from the mayor on down saying that, oh, we're in support of establishing a community group that's going to, you know, talk about police issues and be doing the, the civilian uh, community arm of oversight. And I haven't seen any movement forward on that. So please. Thank, thank you. you. Um, do we have um, any pre-recorded public comments? There are no pre-recorded public comments. Okay. Um, there are a number of questions are raised. Um, I think I'll just keep it simple. Um, and one, I'll ask um, either of you if you would like to respond to any of the questions that were raised. By you, I mean uh, the chief and the lieutenant. Uh, 
Yeah, uh, Chair Fleming, I'd, I'd be happy if you have any specific, you want to direct me to any of those specific comments. Um, I do, I do want to uh, point out that um, there was a comment about the website. Um, if, uh, if you go to srcity.org uh, slash file a complaint, um, you will find uh, there's a bullet point. It says, if, if you prefer to communicate with someone outside of the police department, you may contact the independent auditor and there's a link uh, to the auditor. So it is there. It's also, their phone number is also there. Uh, we can work on uh, making it a little bit more visible. Uh, maybe put it, we'll, we'll see if we can move it to the top. Uh, rather than um, uh, um, uh, in the middle of the uh, of the web page, but it is there. Um, and uh, the independent auditor, uh, the phone number, which is on the website, it's area code 323-412-0334. Uh, the second thing I wanted to uh, uh, talk about, or there was a, uh, another question about uh, the, the community advisory or community uh, ambassador team. Um, it is that it's an ambassador team. It is not an oversight. Um, it is an advisory and provides feedback uh, to uh, to myself. Um, it is the starting point where we look and um, and try to get some direction. Um, it will not be the only um, uh, uh, community. Uh, uh, entity that uh, OIR will speak with um, in, in the future. And then um, the final thing, uh, there was a comment about uh, code of conduct and again, the, the uh, um, uh, militia groups and extremist groups came up. Uh, the Being a part of a violent extremist uh, group uh, has no place at the Santa Rosa Police Department. If we become aware of anybody being involved in a violent group and violates our code of conduct, it will be dealt with uh, uh, significantly here. So um, there is no place at the police department for uh, that type of behavior. Uh, I want the, want the community to be assured of that. We will look into that in a thorough manner and we'll work with OIR on that. Uh, the OIR group uh, will be conducting as Lieutenant uh, Harrington mentioned uh, uh, annual report outs. Uh, so there are uh, uh, there are uh, points in the future where uh, OIR is planning on reporting out to uh, uh, to city council, and um, there's uh, I'm sure they will take feedback uh, from uh, you or the city manager as to uh, what else they need to be doing. Uh, the reason we were reporting out is just because we are at the beginning. Uh, we wanted to just let you know, we wanted to remind the community how to be able to access and how they are working with the police department. Thank you. All right. Well, with that, um, I see what um, council member Rogers. Chief, I might be a little slow, but I am on the website. Um, and I, I don't see where under citizen complaints, or it is, uh, I see one, two, three, four, five, mail. You can mail a letter to the police department for a complaint. You can call um, Monday through Thursday. You can send an email to SRPD. Um, you can pick up a complaint form, English or Spanish, um, or you can download a complaint form so is what I, I see. I'm looking at, uh, so I, we will double check to make sure we have, um, I'm looking at the same thing and I see another bullet point if you prefer to communicate with someone outside the police department. So uh, before we get off, I will make sure uh, we have the appropriate link and we will work on that uh, right now. But uh, the um, I'm looking at a website. If you go to the learn, if you go to learn about uh, our on our website, there's file a complaint, and it should be under there at the bottom. I think so, I'm just on your your homepage. I okay. want to say SRPD homepage. There's a, a file a complaint, and um, I'm. I would I would say that that were if there's a file a complaint section there, then um, all the information needs to be uniform. Whether we're going exactly to a file a complaint page or 
I don't know, but that that's where I think I am. So yeah, we, we should check it out. We, we will double check. I'm not sure what's going on because I'm hitting the same links you are. And um, I'm coming up with, this, with a bullet point, an additional bullet point at the bottom to uh, contact the IPA. So uh, we, will, we will make sure that that contact information is available for the public. It should be there. Um, I'm looking at it. And so we, we'll get that worked out. So uh, if, if it's not available right now, we apologize. We'll get it corrected here shortly. Thank you. All right. Well done, everyone. So we have one more um, item, which is to finish up with our pre-recorded public comment. Thank you. And I do apologize for earlier. Uh, I, think I, I missed a checkbox in Zoom for sound. So hopefully you'll be able to hear them this time. Please let me know if you do not. Thank you. Hi, my name is Renee Lopalato. I'd like to leave a public comment for the agenda item four on the April 20th meeting. And my comment has to do with this current present city code that allows dogs uh, to be returned to their owners without any kind of sanctions on the owners. We we lived in the neighborhood when the two pit bulls went on their rampage, got out from their fence, and terrorized the neighborhood and then killed two family cats and also attacked a neighbor in a carport. These animals were taken back to their home, and as far as we know, there have been no consequences either for the owners or the animals. We feel strongly that the animals should not be euthanized, but rather that the owners should be fined. That should be the very least that happens. The amount of fine and the timing of the fine, I would leave, of course, to the wisdom of the public safety uh, subcommittee. This has happened before in Santa Rosa with dogs jumping out of trucks and killing people and killing animals. So uh, those are our feelings. I hope you will take them into consideration, and we look forward to a result. Thank you so much. Were you able to hear that? That was perfect. Thank okay, you. Okay, good. I'll do the next one then. Hi, this is Sergey Zimbarov, referring to agenda item four. I feel that the code leads heavily in the direction of the offending animals. It needs to be changed to recognize the other animals that we love, care for, and consider as our family members. Thank you. All right. With that, we have no further items. Our next public safety subcommittee meeting will be in June. I want to Thank the members of the public, members of our staff, and um, everybody who participated. And a, a strong thank you to our committee members as well. With that, we are now adjourned.